We have uh, Rick Finley, which many of you have met before. He's a National Food Service Account Director for the Dairy Farmers of Wisconsin. Uh, and one of our you know, sponsors has been a sponsor for years and years and years. So Rick, thanks for being here and help, helping to put this together on our Cinco de Mayo celebration. Yeah, well, thank you, uh, Kevin, and happy Cinco de Mayo to everyone. And, you know, on behalf of the dairy farmers of Wisconsin, we just uh, are thrilled to death to uh, sponsor this. And we're a nonprofit organization. We're a marketing arm for the dairy farmers. Uh, and they, I, I work for 7,000 farmers, and I work for a little over 100 different cheese producers. And one of those we're just super excited to have with us today, uh, V and V Supremo. Uh, well, you'll you'll be able to see some of their products and all, and they are just absolutely amazing. But uh, as I mentioned, you know those dairy farmers. Not only do they support us financially, and it's it's funding that comes from the checkoff dollars for the milk that they produce. But you know they work so hard. Those cows, you know, they milk them two three times a day, seven days a week. They don't get a day off, so they work so hard and it's just kind of incumbent for us to work that hard on their behalf and be tireless advocates and, and that sort of thing. And as it relates to milk in Wisconsin, most of it, over 90% of it goes into making the wonderful cheese. And uh, most of that goes into um, yeah, actually, I guess we can go down. There's a picture of those, uh, just a, a sample of the farmers. And then there's uh, just a, a comment about the 600 varieties. So that milk goes into just some phenomenal uh, specialty varieties. And you're going to see some of that today from Supremo. It's just absolutely uh, amazing from that standpoint. Wisconsin wins more awards from uh, uh, than any other state, any other country that there is. Oh, you know, and I guess I should have mentioned, Kevin, and I know you got yours, and uh, most of the folks on this call got some boxes uh, that came from uh Wisconsin, but also with some samples of that phenomenal Supremo cheese in it. So we want to thank them for, uh, you know, giving that out to you guys. And just a little reminder of how uh, uh, Wisconsin is the state of cheese. There's no doubt about it. And just one other thing, and it kind of leads me into our next, uh, if you maybe go to the next slide, is... Wisconsin's the only state that you have to be a certified cheesemaker to be able to even produce it. Uh, only in Europe do they have that. And uh, there's even a, a scenario where they take it up a notch. So not only are you a cheesemaker, but to become a master cheesemaker, uh, not to embarrass uh, Tom, who's going to be uh, joining us in just a minute, but you know, it can take 10 to 12 years to get that certification and that title. Frankly, you could become a doctor quicker than you can a master cheesemaker. So maybe we'll just start calling him Dr. Tom or whatever moving forward. But uh, Supremo has the privilege of having a, uh, che a master cheesemaker. And Tom is uh, the one that has that. And uh, I, I guess you know, after welcoming you, I just want to turn it over to Tom. Tell us a little bit about your story, your journey, and that'll segue us into Supremo and then get into some cheese and then just celebrating Cinco de Mayo. So uh, it's all about that cheese. So Tom, take it away. Thank you, Rick. I've been called many things in my career, but usually doctor is not really one of them. So I, I appreciate that uh, that offering. Uh, personally, I'm a second generation cheesemaker. My father, uh, I was introduced to it by him, uh, moved on to get a collegiate degree to actually get out of dairy, simply gravitated back and have enjoyed every second of it. So uh, talking about the master program a little bit, uh, that's a program that will take you uh, above and beyond just the simple cheesemaker license, which the state of Wisconsin requires to have in all plants, uh, specifically during production hours. 
The program's been in place for a little over 25 years. Approximately 90 people have been certified as masters so far. Uh, so a little bit of background, you know, about the program is this. Uh, really, it's another step for Wisconsin to have its product step over and above product from other states. Uh, I'll be very honest about it. I, I think it's a wonderful program overall. So a little bit of background is that there's a formal sequence of courses that you have to uh, complete. Uh, also, it adds value with the master title. I think it does separate us from many other states that do produce product. And uh, we're serious enough about it that we've gone to extensive study beyond even the licensing uh, requirements. So it's an ongoing and it, it's actually co-sponsored by uh, the Center for Dairy Research at UW Extension and Dairy Farmers of Wisconsin. So that's a very interesting combination, but it's uh, also very effective and efficient. So we appreciate all their backing. Um, so you say, what do you what do you have to do to get into the program? Um, you have to apply to begin with, and then there's quite an extensive uh, entry level uh, steps that you have to go through. First of all, you have to be licensed for a minimum of 10 years, licensed cheesemaker in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, also, uh, people come in to interview you but along with that interview, they review your quality assurance program and also they tour your plant. And also we will grade and flavor our own products that we make on site here. So it's quite extensive. And then at the end of that, uh, honestly speaking, there's an oral exam. Uh, my whole interview process took uh, roughly two and a half hours. So I thought it was a bit of a walk in the park that we could chat cheese for a few minutes. And guess what? I found out the hard way that that's, that's not how you get admitted to the master program. But uh, I was lucky enough that they, uh, they allowed me in. And I, I appreciate that. So once you're admitted to, uh, what's required after that? Well, here's the requirements. Um, there's educational courses. There's a series of educational courses you have to complete. Like a college program, there's some required and some selective. Um, and, and I think yeah, I'm a big believer in continuing education. And one of the big challenges for our industry is <clears throat> training for even entry level people and hourly people and all the above. Uh, the better off we all are, the better off everyone and our products are. So uh, you have a period of time. The program takes roughly a, a short three years after admittance to the program to complete the courses uh, so that's, that's very interesting, quite a wide range of courses. Uh, also annually, you send products in and they are graded and they are also tested for analytical, which would be like fat, moisture, salt, pH, and micro bi biological results as to safety of the product also. And that's done uh, yearly because the three years that you're entering, coming up through the program to complete it, that takes case and also even after you are certified as a master, uh, you still turn in uh, yearly samples for approval. We just received uh, our approval letter probably about two, three weeks ago after sending samples up to you know, licensed graders and such. Uh, so that's, that's how you become one. And then there's the infamous oral exam. Guys I knew were telling me that they put you know, 50 hours, give or take, into the exam. And I thought, whoa, whoa that's, a, that's a heck of an exam. Uh, I used to try to get by in 10 minutes or less, but that didn't work that well anyhow. So the oral exam, I'll be very honest, I put in between 50 and 60 hours uh, to do that. And one of the things I still appreciate is when I was admitted, I was given a box of books and they're basically uh, collegiate textbooks is what they are. And I will admit, I, I'm the guy who enjoys reading things like that and papers on starter cultures and all things like that. So uh, I think it's ongoing as to continue your gaining of knowledge. And the biggest thing that most of the guys that I know in the program, there's quite a few in Green and Lafayette County here, will say, I, I was a pretty good cheesemaker, but I didn't understand all the science behind it. And I think these courses allow you the opportunity to both listen to and rub shoulders with many of the top, oh, the, uh, the top academia up at the University of Wisconsin. 
and that's, I think, worth its weight in gold. Uh, again, thank God there's no uh, su such thing as a foolish questioner. They've probably thrown me out of the program. But uh, it was very interesting. Uh, and I appreciate all the, the work that everybody put into that. So the oral exam is kind of the final uh, hoorah. And you kind of wait for probably a month or two. And there's a board of directors that reviews uh, all of your qualifications, the exam itself, and everything. And then comes back to you and says, okay, uh, you will now be certified as a master cheese maker, uh, recognized by the state of Wisconsin. So that's basically that's great, the details. Okay. That's great, Tom. It really is. It's, it's interesting to hear the painstaking process you have to do and how many years you dedicate to it. So uh, thanks for sharing that with us. And I think with this, we're going to go to Olga in the kitchen now. So Olga can tell us a little bit more about your company and um, and what you guys are doing today and show us some of the wonderful food I know you guys have uh, prepared for today. Olga? Yes. Thank you so much. So, Tom, thank you so much for all your hard work. We wouldn't be able to do it with, without you. Um, thank you all for joining us today. I am going to make you wait a little bit on the whole food side because the chefs are going to, well, Chef Kevin is going to go ahead and do that a little bit later. But I do want to tell you a little bit about our company and you know our, some of our humble beginnings. Um, we're still family owned and operated. We started in the Pilsen neighborhood in 1964, and we're still here. Um, we are USDA. We're SQF certified. We're minority certified. We pretty much run the same way we ran several and many many years ago. Um, the owners are still very active here at BNB and they have a lot and if not everything to do with everything that goes on um, on a daily basis. Our cheese, one of the biggest takeaways and the fact that we are a um, Wisconsin made cheese, we've won several world uh, championship contests and we've done so year over year. So that's something that we are very proud of. Uh, Chihuahua cheese, our Chihuahua cheese and our Oaxaca cheese have both uh, done so in that aspect. They both won awards and I mean, once you, hopefully you guys get to try it in those boxes that were sent over by DFW. And if you need anything else, you know, you guys can always reach to our website and you can get a lot more information there, even a site um, to contact us, a way to contact us. So uh, with all that being said, I can go ahead and go into the next slide. And this is just to highlight a little bit of how there's a ton of other, uh, there's a ton of ingredient accounts that are ours that are on here. And there's also, we wanted to make sure that we highlighted accounts that are using authentic products, which is what we are. b, &B has authentic Mexican recipes and we have a full portfolio of authentic Mexican cheeses. And if these, these customers are our customers or they're already using authentic um, products. And as you can see, it's not just, a Mexican restaurant, um, you know, we go all the way from Hooters to Starbucks, um, Taylor Farms, an ingredient account, to Home Chef, who's near and dear to my heart, <laughs> and um, I mean, many others that, that you guys can see up there. So we hope to show you a couple of things later on so you guys can see some of what we're doing out there and some ideas for seeing who am I on what you can do um, moving forward. And that's it for me for now. And I think I'm gonna take it out with Brian. Okay, thanks so much, Olga. We appreciate it. Yeah, so now we're going to do a presentation. Brian Lanucha, who's the Insights and Thought Leadership for VNB Supremo. And Carly Levin, thanks for being with us as well. She's the Account Manager for Data Central. Uh, so they're going to go through a little presentation on what's happening and trends and with uh, particular about, you know, Hispanic and Mexican cheeses. So you are on. All right, thanks, Kevin. Yeah, as you mentioned, I'm Brian Lanucha. I'm the Head of Insights and Thought Leadership at VNB Supremo. Um, where we like to start, and we can get much more granular with this information um, as specific needs dictate, but we like to start at a pretty high level just from total Hispanic population and spending trends across the U.S. So the chart across the top here talks about population growth from 2010 to 2019. So some of the builds here in the slide show you that uh, the Hispanic population accounts for over 52% of that growth. So and it's much bigger than any other groups. I mean, you see, if you look at, uh, you know, the groups across from the very bottom here at 0% red, um, if we have a slide build coming up, Carly, um, it shows how much of that, yeah, so there we go. So how much of the growth is coming from other groups? Well, Hispanic is making up over 50% of that growth. And as we continue with the additional builds down, 
Uh, you know, we have an image here. So also talking about the purchasing power. So nearly true, nearly $2 trillion spend up 30%. Um, and then within that population and that spending power, another key theme here is how young this population is too. Uh, the largest sector within Hispanic is millennials and Gen Z. You know, all the people, and they're, very, they're much more multicultural in their food um, tastes and where they go to eat. Uh, will they consume food at home or at restaurants? Um, so moving from there with the theme of that population, like I said, we can get more granular, but on the next slide, we talk about how those trends are evolving um, from a menu perspective. So on the right-hand side here, the bars we have highlighted in blue. So if you talk, so if you think about authentic Hispanic ingredients, as Olga mentioned, um, you know, V and V Supremo kind of plays in any of those, whether it's global foods and flavors, um, you know, nostalgic and comfort foods. We'll talk about that a little bit because what just popped up in the in the pie chart on the left-hand side here is that that's how VNV is in the Chicago market. Uh, it's a nostalgic brand. It's the brand that the community in the Pilsen neighborhood and a very authentic neighborhood as well on uh, the Hispanic community. It's a type of product that folks ate growing up. So go ahead, Carly. I'm going to pass to Carly now too to build on that nostalgic, you know, sort of local market authenticity of VNV Supremo. First, so this is um, from Data Central's local tool, which compares menuing of an item across the total U.S. versus independent restaurants within a specific area. So here we're looking at a map that looks at the menuing of Chihuahua in different metro areas. The darker green colors are means that it's menued much more often there. And we can actually look at the local scores for the different metro areas. So everything above 100 means it's menued more there than across the total U.S. So if we look at the Chicago metro area, Chihuahua is actually found on menus there five times more than it is across the total U.S. So it's, you know, um, a familiar item in this region. It's something people who grew up in this region ate quite a bit growing up. Thanks, Carly. And segueing back to the topic of comfort food, um, building on what Carly just what Carly just mentioned, you know, on the left hand side of this chart, you see some of the usual suspects that you probably expect to be considered comfort food across the U.S. You know, mac and cheese, chocolate chip cookies, um, chicken pot pie, lasagna. But if you look a little bit further to the right, what also makes the list are avocados empanadas at 13 percent. And then and, and then if you go further to the left in the middle there. Uh, there's a build coming up here, 37% uh, for tacos. And, you know, and then, so that's total U.S. across all generations. But can anyone guess whether that number is bigger or smaller based on what I said about uh, the younger populations like Gen Z? Do we think that number is higher or lower in terms of considering tacos to be a comfort food? So as you might guess, it's higher. Uh, and it's quite a few points higher. Gen Z, that number comes in at 54%. So again, the dynamic with the population is that, you know, there are more multicultural, global influence foods that are more you know, for the younger population that's growing of what, and dining out at restaurants. Uh, that trend is, so, is even that much higher, which segues nicely then from the taco to just Mexican food in general. Uh, and this was a survey that was fielded prior to the pandemic. So it was like, so I shouldn't say prior to the pandemic, but I guess at the very beginning of the lockdown of asking, what do you crave miss the most from restaurants? You know, I know we talked about Cinco de Mayo at the beginning. Um, what do you crave miss the most from restaurants uh, during the lockdown? Well, Mexican food was at the very top of the list. So, and, and Carly's going to share some trends with you later of what that looks like. It's still high on that list, um, but in terms of lockdown and making food at home, folks really wanted to miss, miss the most from the restaurants was going out to eat their Mexican food. And that segues nicely to today being Cinco de Mayo, um, definitely pent up demand for Cinco de Mayo and, and opportunities like Taco Tuesday as well. Some of the restaurant examples we have here were in some of the publications that came out in, in, in uh, 2020 in terms of, you know, what folks were doing for Cinco de Mayo and just the growth because the, the amount of people that ordered carryout went through a drive through. Um, I think they're, again, speaking to that pent up demand, there was very high growth on Cinco de Mayo last year in terms of care out orders and drive through. And it has really has become an American celebration. You know, I think if you, I actually attended a webinar just before this and they were asked a survey question of what Cinco de Mayo actually celebrates and what people's responses were at number one was Mexico's independence, which actually it's not, it's actually the city of Puebla. 
um, uh, fighting off the, the French army. You know, it was really a David and Goliath type of story of fighting them off. But really, some of the survey responses now, and it's true from a marketing perspective and true from your, you know, in terms of your restaurants, that it's really become, you know, sort of a national um, in the U.S. Uh, occasion or event. Um, and, you yeah, know, it is Mexican influence. You know, they said even, you know, Hispanics who come from other countries, you know, they, they kind of assimilate first to the Mexican Hispanic culture which is tied back to Cinco de Mayo, even though it's celebrated in Puebla and not nationwide in Mexico like it is in the U.S. Later on in the pandemic, um, using our flavor tool, we took a look to see what restaurant foods consumers would be the most excited for. So this is what they said they crave the most and what they most favored getting away from home. And again, what we see pop is those um, Mexican food, street tacos, that kind of usually more authentic and traditional style of taco, and Cuban sandwiches too. And taking a look further at what people prefer to get away from home, we can see lots of um, different foods like um, chalupas, Cuban sandwiches, a couple different cuisines. And we can compare that with what people want to have most when they're at home. And taking a look at these items, this is very American classic comfort food, PB&J, casseroles, stews, sloppy joes. But when we look at, the, again, what consumers want to get away from home, do we notice any patterns here? And the thing that we notice is that most of these items are global and they're from other cuisines. So with global food, especially, you know, things like Mexican food, like chalupas, et cetera, people prefer to get those away from home because they likely don't have the ingredients or the expertise to make a lot of these dishes at home. And in fact, if we look at, um, you know, what pe the share of preference, we can see that cuisines overall are preferred to get away from home. So different cuisines other than American and global entrees and global appetizers too, because there's that trust. If I go to the restaurant, I know it's going to be better than what I can make for myself at home. And oftentimes, um, and we'll see later, even in dishes outside the cuisine, Mexican cheeses can help a dish feel more authentic. And looking at the growth on menus over the past 10 years, we can see Mexican cheese overall is now found on almost 13% of menus and has grown by 128% over the past 10 years. And some of the cheeses that are made in Wisconsin, like Chihuahua and Oaxaca cheese, are also experiencing growth. We took a look to see what the penetration on menus, this is the percent of those types of restaurants offering Mexican cheese, looked like on ethnic versus non-ethnic menus. And the ethnic menus are going to be those global menus and global cuisines like Mexican, Central American, and the non-ethnic is going to be things like barbecue, American food, and pizza. So we can see that Mexican cheeses are a bit more common in ethnic restaurants. But if we look to see where the growth is coming from, we can see over the past four years, Mexican cheeses have grown by 16% on ethnic menus, so they're still being added to those menus. But on non-ethnic, so again, that's your American, your barbecue, your pizza, is where the growth in Mexican cheese is coming from, is more operators turn to those Mexican cheeses to help add a hint of authenticity to the menu. And when they're putting dishes on the menu that feature Mexican cheese, not all of them are, you know, those traditional tacos, et cetera. We're even seeing things like a cauliflower crust pizza with veggies that's got cotija cheese on it, or a short rib mac and cheese, an upscale comfort food that has a chihuahua cheese crust too. Um, we are also seeing more traditional Mexican dishes on um, non-ethnic menus, like a chorizo skillet, which has um, more of those authentic ingredients or the Oaxaca pizza. We can see this happening at chains too. If we take a look at our scores database, which um, tracks consumer um, reactions to different LTOs put out by chains each month. And um, before we go into them, I'm just going to talk through a little bit on how to um, interpret the data. We take a look at um, some KPIs and two of the most important are purchase intent and uniqueness. So we're asking consumers, is this an item you'd be interested in purchasing and is this very unique? Um, we also assign each item an overall score, so anything above 70 is pretty good. And we also assign them a menu viability rating. The menu viability ratings can be either a superstar, which is that item that has strong performance with strong appeal and uniqueness, so that's something that would have a higher purchase intent and uniqueness. Appeals to lots of different consumers, can't get it anywhere. And we also have our volume drivers that have high appeal but aren't very unique, and our specialty items that are really unique and trendy but some consumers might be a little wary of. And taking a look at Mexican cheese introductions in chains, we can see that there have been quite a few over the past couple years. So I'm going to pull up a couple here. 
And what was interesting to me as I look through these is you can see that what's happening in restaurants is happening, um, you know, in chain introductions too. We have a Texas queso fry and we have a protein avocado pollo bowl. These aren't things that are part of traditional Mexican cuisine, but traditional Mexican cheeses like, um, you know, queso smothered fries with white Mexican cheese, queso fresco, tapatio seasoning, all these are being used to help these dishes feel more trend forward. And we're also seeing um, more classic and authentic Mexican dishes like a sirloin street taco here. This pork carnitas omelet from First Wash is really interesting because this is kind of the mashup. Um, you have the omelet and you can see it's got some classic melting cheeses like Monterey Jack and Cheddar, but it's also got pork carnitas and cotija cheese as well. And you can see this one scored pretty high with a specialty appeal. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Olga and Chefs Kevin and Mario for their virtual recipe demonstration. Thank you so much, Carly. Thank you, everyone. So now we take it away to, I just want to introduce really quick our chefs. Chef Mario, he will be behind the camera today. Um, he is Andy's executive chef. He had a ton to do with what's happening here today. And then we have our corporate chef, Kevin Corrales, who is our superstar of the day, and he'll be talking to us through the recipes and through our product. Now we're on. And now we're on. Okay, great. Um, yeah, there's one really kind of a neat connection with our company in Wisconsin, I think, that um, um, we like to mention is that the founders came from Michoacan, Mexico, which is considered by a lot of people to be like the Wisconsin of Mexico. So there's that kind of dairy centric feel to the whole, you know, company, um, which is clear because we make cheese. Anyway, um, we're going to get on to the actual applications, uh, I suppose. And we're going to start with what seems to be, uh, pretty mundane in the sense that it's a quesadilla, but we want to talk about quesadillas a little bit, um, because it is, uh, sort of a segue, a great, you know, segue into everything that's been said so far. You know, quesadillas are Mexican, obviously, um, and there are other, you know, Hispanic uh, cuisines use them too. But at this point, and for a long time, for decades and decades, I would say, or decades, um, America has really embraced quesadillas at some level. So, you know, you're seeing them throughout the country at various types of restaurants. It doesn't, obviously, everybody knows it doesn't have to be an Hispanic restaurant. Could be anything at all. You know, a lot of bars and grills, a lot of family restaurants. Uh, and the cool thing about them, we think, uh, is that, uh, one of the cool things, is that you can go as uh, humble as you want to, as basic as you want to, some, you know, flour tortillas and some cheese, hopefully, you would use the Chihuahua cheese because that's the best for quesadillas. But you can also elevate it up to a billion, you know, things like, uh, you know, in Mexico, you might see huitlacoche, which is a corn mushroom uh, used for the quesadillas. Um, you know, you can elevate it as high as you want and put lobster and everything else in it. So, um, you know, we're seeing all sorts of a range here. The sky's the limit. So what we've done here is... Um, sort of touch on all this. Um, these are quesadillas made with corn tortillas and the, the best corn tortillas you can find is, it, you know, we recommend that you would buy those. Um, obviously you need the foundation. So the best cheese you can find, which, you know, that would be the Chihuahua. And um, what we did here is sort of fusion it up a little bit. Um, and uh, we put in some uh, kimchi that's been sauteed with a bit of egg, just as a vehicle, some uh, very, traditional Asian, uh, you know, uh, flavors like sesame oil and, um, you know, green onion and things like that is in the mix. So um, that's the deal there. And the idea is that the kimchi, and for those of you who haven't had it, you know, it, maybe it's an acquired taste. Um, I don't find it to be that, but, you know, it's, it's a fermented cabbage that's very uh, prevalent in Korea and Korean cuisine. But we really feel like... Um, thanks to Tom's craftsmanship and just beautiful cheese that he creates, um, that Chihuahua cheese, uh, the butteriness and the richness uh, really works well with sharp sort of acidic flavors like kimchi is. You know, it's it's very kind of sharp and, and direct, very garlicky, very, you know, chili centric and, you know, the cabbage is a little crunchy. 
So that buttery richness of the cheese melded with that, um, you know, it was really a neat little combo. Um, we don't, uh, you know, I think fusion is something that you got to be a little careful with, but um, when it works, it works. And the corn tortilla and beautiful cheese with these fillings, I think, is uh, a great combo. And it's a different way of looking at a quesadilla. And you could even consider these to be tacos if you wanted to play fast and loose with the whole concept because, uh, you know, they're made like a quesadilla, but they kind of look like tacos and that corn tortilla is uh, yeah. sort of, you know. And, I mean, to your point, like you're saying about the quesadilla, they're very versatile. I mean, you could use the quesadillas in many, you can throw many different things into them and add that to your menu. And, you know, there's plenty of kids that love quesadillas. I mean, there's a bunch of kids' menus um, that, for the most part, I see quesadillas on it everywhere, you know, so it can be a really high end restaurant or wherever you go. And if you have a quesadilla, most likely a kid is going to go for it. Um, and if, you know, if you do try our chihuahua cheese um, and you make it a quesadilla, then we highly suggest chihuahua cheese. Um, yeah, yeah. That's it. yeah, it's really neat. 32% butterfat content and it really brings it into, a, you know, brings it uh, into a uh, what it, it's just beautiful cheese um so um that's the idea behind uh, showing the quesadilla it's kind of like it's a quesadilla cheese technically you know the brand is is uh, b and so um so why wouldn't you make quesadillas with it you know and uh that's the story behind this particular application this is a little crema made with some scallions and ginger and sriracha and all this kind of stuff so that's you know you can dip the the quesadilla into the crema and uh, you have the whole experience. No, you can't try these probably, but we'll make you some fresh ones. Um, so that's the deal with this, this idea. Um, the second one is the uh, molletes. And uh, molletes maybe aren't as familiar to people. And what they are, though, is a, a classic Mexican breakfast dish traditionally. And what they do down in central Mexico, Mexico City, particularly, um, is they take, uh, you know, bread, um, like a baguette or, or a torta or whatever, and butter it, toast it, and do a smear of black beans. Um, and they top it off with cheese, melting cheese, and um, maybe a little salsa or some pico de gallo, and that's it. And they walk around eating that for breakfast, you know, sometimes on, you know, in the fondas in the little restaurants or on the street or whatever. It seems like an unlikely breakfast, but that's the deal. So what we've done is um, just sort of made that into sort of min a mini idea because they wouldn't be this small in Mexico. They'd be kind of big. Um, so uh, sort of cut baguettes, toasted them up into small, you know, smaller portions and, uh, you know, made a base of black beans and chorizo and then topped it off with the Oaxaca. You can use the Oaxaca or the Chihuahua. They both work, you know, very well for this. And then sort of revved up the toppings a little bit to include some, you know, pickled onions and some uh, lime marinated, um, you know, cucumbers and avocado and tomato and all that. So you've got, you know, again, the idea is uh, the rich butteriness of the cheese, and the richness of the cheese, the sharpness of the um, the garnishes and the, the acid provided in the garnishes and, you know, the base of bread, which, you know, usually in Mexico, you would think of a tortilla base or a masa, I should say, base. So, um, so we thought that, you know, that's kind of a neat way of um, not only for, you know, obviously this is pretty Mexican type, you know, um, treatment here, um, but, you um, we kind of feel like, you know, you can take this general idea and top it off with all sorts of things. And, um, you know, it's, it's a neat little appetizer idea, you know, so that was the idea there. Um, so many way I with some tequila on the side. That would be ideal, even if it was eight o'clock in the morning, that's right. <laughs> especially today, I suppose. Um, so that's the deal there. Um, so that's very central Mexico inspired. Um, and we just thought we'd do a riff on that whole thing. And um, the third thing we'd like to show you is um, something that again, ties into what everybody's been talking about. 
And that kind of like um, indicates the sort of versatility of the cheese. Um, so you can do all these flatbreads and pizzas and things like that. Why not? You know, it's just good cheese. You don't have to pigeonhole it into, um, boy, I'm not doing Hispanic today or Mexican today. It's like, that's okay. It's not going to hurt anything that it touches. It's going to help anything that it touches. So what we did um, is a flatbread. So every, uh, you know, a lot of people uh, are doing, a lot of restaurants are doing flatbreads. Um, you know, you don't have to be a pizzeria. You can just, you know, do a flatbread crust. And what we did here is used uh, what's called a guisado in Mexico. So we wanted to sort of like, again, do a little fusion -y deal here where it's a flatbread, which is kind of American, uh, the way it is, uh, I mean, it could be, um, and take in a stewed pork that has been stewed in salsa verde and use that as the base, as sort of the sauce. And then topped it off with our beautiful Chihuahua cheese, and then, you know, get it out of the oven and throw, you know, fresh, again, fresh garnishes. There's a recurring theme here. Um, the acidity of the fresh garnishes are, you know, really a nice little contrast. And the idea of the guisado, or the, basically what that just means is a stew. Um, the idea here with the salsa verde we found over the years is that as wonderful as, as Chihuahua cheese is on a pizza with tomato sauce and all that, um, it's pretty amazing with a salsa verde because of the sharpness of the, again, the sharpness and the acidity of the tomatillo and the rich butteriness of the cheese. Uh, it's just an amazing contrast. So we really like to drive that home as much as we can. And we sort of exploit that whole idea as much as we can. So again, rich butteriness and, you know, sharp acidity. Um, and in passing, we'll just mention a couple other things. We just, uh, threw together a fondito, which is just broiled cheese. Uh, in this case, it's gotta be broiled chihuahua. Um, it behaves beautifully in the broiler. There's beautiful toast points, uh, it stretches beautifully. You shoot that off to the table with a fork and uh, corn tortillas and some salsa, and people can construct their own tacos. It's a communal appetizer, and you can top it anywhere you want. So yeah. very simple, very to the point. And that's another appetizer that they can do what ever they want to they can add mushrooms they can make it veggie they can you know add meat to it so that's yeah absolutely that's universal yeah too. so that's yeah so a lot of these things you know are you know can be mexican in nature and then they can just be sort of extrapolated um and i think i think we're seeing that more and more across the country where you know um people are using these influences and all this kind of stuff they're 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 touching on the cuisine without necessarily um, you know, diving all the way in. So there's that that's going on. Don't forget the tequila. Yeah. And you could use that to make a flaming cheese like the Greek, you know, Saganaki and all that stuff, you know. Um, so there's all sorts of possibilities there. And then the last thing is um, maybe not a novelty exactly. It's just we wanted to show this because it's kind of a cool thing you can do with this cheese, which, well, um, you can sprinkle some onto a, um, what would it be called? Like a baking dish, Pyrex or whatever, and throw it in the microwave. We discovered this fairly recently, which means about three years ago or something. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if you treat it the right way, it's a little bit fussy that you have to keep on rotating and all that. But once you have it, you have it. Um, it it'll form this kind of, you know, really cool uh, uh, sort of a crisp, you know. And you can use these as, you know, Races. sort of chips and things like that, you know, sort of a no carb chip or low carb chip. You can use them to garnish salads and, you know, the chef will know what to do with it. So we just included that because we we think it's cool. Um, so an Oga is making you a taco or something. But, um, and hey, Kevin, Kevin, can you also do that? Would that be done in like a cast iron skillet or a flat top? I mean, you could probably do that in other ways as well, right? Absolutely, Kevin. Um, and we have in the past, you know, we've used the oven and we've used the, the skillet, as you're saying, and that's all legit and it does work. It's just that, you know, um, we found that if if you have the ability to do the microwave, it's really cool because it's sort of it seems like it crisps it up the best and um, it holds really well. Like these things won't lose their texture for a few days if you know you just cover them up. So it's really kind of a neat. That's you know. amazing. It really is. Yeah. 
Yeah, we just got a kick out of that because, you know, we were doing that exact thing that you're saying, you know, and then we wandered into, we had another kitchen with other people working on retail things. And um, they they had some chicharron out. And I said, well, what's this? It's the chicharron. I go, yeah, but, you know, what did you, how did you do that? You know, it looks, it's in a square. And so we use the microwave and it's like, bing. You know, those are the magic <laughs> moments where, you know, it pays to talk to people, I guess. Um, so, yeah, that was really kind of exciting for us. Um, so, yeah, that's that's kind of like the deal. And and uh, I don't know, I guess we'll touch on the, the differences between Oaxaca and Chihuahua a little bit. You know, um, Chihuahua is our, you know, mega super, superstar, obviously. And that's, you know, it's so rich and it, you know, it can do all these things. Uh, it's 32% butterfat. Oaxaca is um, less buttery. It's more lactic in, in uh, character. So it's more milky. And uh, it's a string cheese, so they can use it either way. They can use it as is or they can melt it. So, uh, you know, both cheeses are, are amazing. And they represent, one represents the North Mexico, the other one, you know, the South of Mexico. And uh, so we've got our bases covered here, we think. And Oaxaca is 23% butterfat. Right, so Chihuahua's 32. 32. So we just flip the numbers, you know, just happens to work that way. And then so, we also have the Chihuahua with jalapeno. That's true. We did, I guess we didn't show the uh, the overall uh, products. Of course, we have Chihuahua, we have the Oaxaca, both, both are available in loaf and shred, which makes sense. And then the beautiful Chihuahua with jalapeno, as, um, as Olga is mentioning, which is really neat because it's not overly hot. It's just well balanced. It's true jalapeno flavor. And again, the butteriness of the cheese and the, the sort of tanginess of those brined chilies um, really, you know, make a beautiful bar snack just as is. Um, so if that's cubed up and served with some accompaniments, you're all set. Um, and, you know, again, beer and tequila work well with that. That's for sure and mezcal and everything else. Yeah, and these items are made in Wisconsin by our master cheese makers. And um, this is the biggest reason why we're here today. These are all have the uh, master cheese maker label on them because they're made in Wisconsin from Wisconsin milk. As we keep harping on that, but that's, you know. it's. It's uh, it's a beautiful thing. It's a great you know time we think that for having you know to be selling this kind of cheese to be you know dealing with it because more and more people are getting more and more savvy about all this stuff. It's 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 uh, you know um, again the Hispanic cuisine is so important. Um, not to say that operators are going to be all opening up Hispanic restaurants necessarily, <laughs> but they all do. Not all, but I mean, so many of them do touch on the cuisine. And if they're touching on the cuisine, they might as well be buying the best, you know, cheese. That's that's what we feel anyway. That's great. That just work here. Yeah, that's great. And those that got the kit that you can see, of course, you have to point the other way. Um, yeah, we'll see that some of that cheese was in here, the jalapeno. So I've got to taste this one. Oh yeah. Oh great. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yes, Perfect, yeah. yes, there was some of it in there as well. Yeah, and yeah. so as you can see, so those oh, jalapenos, yeah. they're, they're not freeze-dried. They're actually fresh jalapenos that you see in there. That have been brined, yeah. That have been brined. Yeah. So, so, yeah, so it's really, you, you know, really. This might be a question for Tom, too. Um, and everybody, if you're going to get involved, we're going to do some Q&A here, but uh, make sure you unmute. But um, for Tom, it might be one of those things, too, as a master cheesemaker. So when you're putting jalapenos in the cheese, and Kevin, I'm sure you're going to test this as well. It's like, it's kind of dangerous, right? Because you don't know what you're going to get, right? Any time you get a shipment of jalapenos, they can vary um, in the, you know, the level of, of, uh, of heat. Well, ours, I'll jump in there and answer that. Ours are very consistent. We buy from the same suppliers all the time, uh, Kevin, and we get COAs upon receipt and everything like that. So uh, I don't have too many issues with that. Uh, it, it, it's been very consistent, but that uh, jalapeno product has become very, very popular uh, probably in the last, I've been here about 12 years now, probably in the last five, six years, especially. Uh, we've seen some increases in that going uh, going to people to be consumed. So that's that's outstanding. What's really nice, it's got a nice heat. And it, you know, it, yes. it, I always look at heat, it's like, is it the front of your mouth or the back, you know, or is it, it's really rounded, 
You know, it's it, it's, yeah. it, it's it's really nice, and it's a, it's a mild heat. That blend works very well. I, I've had some that were not enough, and I've had some that were way too much. Yeah. Uh, but this is tends to be a nice blend, as you mentioned. So I appreciate you picking up that. Yeah. So um, I'll throw something at, at Rick um, and unmute so you can talk to us, uh, Rick. But, sure. you know, you obviously you guys are involved in a lot of other, um, you know, types of cheese and ethnic cheeses. But I don't know that there's one like Cinco de Mayo that celebrates so much cheese, right, in, in the environment today, right? Is there anything that comes close to that? Because I think of things like St. Patrick's Day or some other celebration of holidays that we do or Thanksgiving or whatever it might be. It's like they don't really scream cheese as much as Cinco de Mayo does to me. Yeah, I would definitely agree with you, Kevin. I mean, we've got some of those National Cheese Pizza Day, Macaroni and Cheese Day, Curd Day, that sort of thing. But this one having that nuance of ethnicity and all, it's just a fun holiday. It really is. And, and as Brian and Carly talked about, cheese is one of those comfort foods that people just again really appreciate and uh it it goes so well with appetizers as entrees as desserts you know it it's just multifunctional the one that just jumps out at me is that uh dish in the cast iron skillet i'm just ready to make tacos out of that one the the queso-ish kind of uh, uh that's just that's phenomenal just that just looks fantastic. So uh, now you're spot on, Kevin. I mean, that uh, a little beverages, you know, to go with it and all, it doesn't get much better than, and, and that's, I'll just say one or the other, and I'm obviously jaded and get passionate about it, but cheese can be paired with so many things. I mean, we've got materials and can help folks on pairing it with wine, with beer, with spirits, with crackers, with meat, with, I mean, just about everything. So that's what makes it fun. Absolutely. It's funny. So I, growing up in Western Pennsylvania, outside of Pittsburgh, uh, our family, you know, is my grandparents came from Italy. So we use a lot of cheese. But what's really interesting, and I've talked to you guys about this before, it's really kind of funny. Is the one thing that it was something that I don't know why it's a Western Pennsylvania thing because a lot of Polish, Hungarian, or whatever, but brick cheese is the thing, which is the monster without the rind, right? And still to this day, when my mother comes to Florida, she brings a five pound block of brick cheese with us. Not like we can't get it here, but it like, <laughs> It's it's just part of the tradition, right? <laughs> so well, no, so this is that is one of those cheeses. Brick cheese, Kevin, was introduced or you know originated from Wisconsin. So yeah. Uh, oh yeah, that's kind of cool. And and there's some specialty, you know, cheese makers that have just taken that to a whole new level. So oh, it always was that brick that she brought down. It was all Wisconsin cheese. Just yeah. sold in Western Pennsylvania in the ethnic stores there primarily. I mean, it, it was a big deal on the Italian, you know, stores uh, as well. So it's really kind of uh, kind of interesting. Carly, why don't you chime in here a little bit, too? Like, because I know you guys do a lot of research on, you know, on cheese and many other kind of products. What, you know, what can you add to that as well as what's happening with cheese today and trending and uh, what's going on actually in this past year? Was cheese consumption something? And Rick, you can probably talk to this, too, you know. Was more cheese consumed because people were at home doing it, or are they using less cheese at home, and you know they weren't going out to restaurants as much? I don't know what happened in that. Yeah, sure. Um, we're you know global cheeses, especially, and I think you know Mexican um, cheeses are kind of the most well-known global cheeses. Are seeing a lot of growth as more people are interested in the cuisine, and I think it's you know um, Kevin touched on this. We touched on this in the data, but it's they're not just you know being used in like tacos and burritos or molletes anymore. They're actually outside of the cuisine, and they're kind of making that crossover, which is what you want to see for a lasting trend. Um, in terms of during the pandemic, and um, Brian and I touched on this. You know, people have been, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, people were looking for comfort, and cheese is comfort to a lot of people. Um, you know, those like rich, creamy dishes, and like you know that fat content. I think the Chihuahua cheese too it melts so well because of that. Um, so I, you know, 
especially at the beginning of the pandemic when we were all hunkering down and we wanted a little comfort. Um, I don't have the exact numbers to back it up, but it's safe to say that, you know, with that increase in the want and need for comfort food, cheese consumption was probably up a little bit. Awesome. Brian, anything you want to add? We're about to wrap up, so we're getting at five o'clock, but I look for any kind of final thoughts and then uh, we'll introduce our, our video to end it and talk about our next upcoming webinar. So Brian, anything you want to? Yeah, just, just a couple of things. One of which is building on what Carly said is that uh, we've done some cheese segmentations in the past and there are, you know, there's definitely a variety of different folks who buy cheese. And, you know, we, there's a group we call the cheese cheerleader that is the mom that buys the shredded cheese in the store and makes that at home. But there's also a segment within the population to build on Carly's point that melts cheese on just about everything. So there is a, uh, there is a, there is a, there is a target there. You know, hopefully that's within the demographic information I provided as well. We'd have to cross reference that, but there are people who melt cheese on everything. So, you know, like to build on Carly's point about comfort food, um, that's definitely a driver of the usage. I like to see what, what happened with that information during the pandemic. And then also when we talked about Cinco de, Mayo, Cinco de Mayo, which actually I'm curious to see the results this year because 2020 for Cinco de Mayo was actually bigger than 2019, I think because of that pent up demand. So I'd be curious to see the results in 2021. Um, and then also wanna just make note of the fact that moving forward, so in September we have Hispanic Heritage Month, which also aligns to um, National Quesadilla Day. So hopefully we'll, we'll be back later to talk to you folks about that in the future. Um, but then the other thing I mentioned on Cinco de Mayo, you know, on that Cinco de Mayo slide is Taco Tuesday. I mean, that's really become, especially the at-home consumption uh, has become that much more important. I mean, I've seen the retail trends at home. You know, we're all trying to lift up the industry and Data Central's doing a great job of that as well with their weekly webinars. Um, but there are some other Hispanic influenced uh, events to think of in the future as well too, beyond Cinco de Mayo. But I'm really curious to see the results this year. 2020 was bigger than 2019, which I don't think you can say that a lot in a lot of places within the restaurant or food service industry. Hey, Kevin, and I'd be remiss if I didn't just mention that Cinco de Mayo is just one of the 31 days in May, which happens to be American Cheese Month. And when I say American cheese, I don't mean just uh, processed cheese. I mean all the cheese <laughs> that is manufactured in America and all of those specialty cheeses. And certainly I'm biased to some of the ones coming from Wisconsin, but we're just celebrating with a number of restaurants and promoting May as uh, Cheese Month and uh, pushing what we're calling WOW, Wonders of Wisconsin. So just again, thrilled to be partnered with Supremo, thrilled to be partnered with all the great chefs that are part of ICCA and GCIA and you and your whole team and all, and just hope everybody just has a fantastic Cinco de Mayo. And, and maybe a little tequila. Oh, you've got your own margarita. Well, we have our own bartender in here with Megan, who's been making margaritas <laughs> for us, so we can share a little toast at the end of the day. But thanks so much. I'm thankful I'm off the Whole30 diet, you know, thanks to this one. Uh, now we can eat a lot of cheese today, which we already yeah. started with at lunch. But uh, cheers to everyone. Happy Cinco de Mayo. Yes. Thanks for this fabulous content. And uh, I'll make my final comments here. Cheers. 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 <laughs> anyway, yeah. thanks thanks to everyone joining us really appreciate all of our member sponsors and everybody that's uh, been involved today thanks to all of you as presenters i thought it was fantastic and a, and a great perfect celebration for Cinco de Mayo uh, to talk about one of our favorite things that we all love cheese um, but the next one we have on may 19th is going to feature simon majumdar and justin warner uh, their Food Network's Tournament of Champions. They just, if you guys haven't seen that yet, it just wrapped up, but you can, you know, still view it. it. I think it's the best show that the Food Network's ever done. It's a competition with a lot of the chefs we work with over the years. And these are the top notch, you know, people that have won Top Chef or Iron Chef going against each other, kind of like a, a March Madness uh, scenario. You have one day, you, you win or you lose. You go up against and the winner goes forward and the loser's done. And it, it was fantastic. And I don't want to lay surprises out, but some people that we've had as presenters at our past events that have become friends over the years have done very well and get into the finals. 
don't want to spoil it for anybody who's watching it and hadn't finished it yet. But um, that is going to be the next one we have on May 19th. And then we've got the uh, continuation of that series. We'll go on. Uh, we've got our next event, the biggest event uh, of the year and for the last year and a half uh, is going to be in June in Providence, Rhode Island for ICCA, our summit. It's the 29th, uh, 26th through the 29th. All the information is on the website. And then just went to Portland, Maine uh, for our GCIA uh, Culinary Combine. That's going to be in October. And the information, basic information is on the website. Next week, we'll put more information in about that. But it's going to be fantastic. It's a great time of the year to be there. That's when the leaves change. Uh, the restaurants there are just phenomenal. Some of my favorite. I mean, I, I think the best lobster rolls I've ever had in my life. Not a surprise coming from there. But uh, also oysters. Uh, just amazing. So um, thanks to everyone uh, for, the, for today and for being with us. And Mike's going to close us out with our video.